This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we remember Pentagon Papers whistleblower Dan Ellsberg, who died Friday at the age of 92, just months after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. His actions helped take down President Nixon and the war in Vietnam lead to a major victory for press freedom. Over the past half century, Ellsberg remained an anti-war and anti-nuclear activist who inspired a new generation of whistleblowers. We return now to our interview in April, when I asked Dan about the latest leak of Pentagon documents by 21-year-old Air National Guard member Jack Teixeira, who was indicted last week on six counts of willful retention and transmission of classified information. I asked Dan Ellsberg about what the leaks say about the war in Ukraine. It's shown from the reaction to these leaks, uh, the major leak being, <laughs> once again, like the Pentagon Papers, that w when a war appears to be stalemated, it may be stalemated from the inside just as well. That's what the Pentagon Papers showed, that there is no real prospect for progress and that killing people is on either side unjustified by any prospect of any humane result. Intelligence estimates have shown that a year from now, we will probably be in pretty much the same positions, a stalemate, and will not be willing to negotiate. What does that say about our uh, the people who are making our foreign policy? If that doesn't define a, a crisis, an emergency, uh, what would? Well, uh, yes, I suppose the prospect that we're about to lose within a month, and that's not what either is facing yet. I don't want to test how either side reacts if they're facing that. If the U.S. were to do what Biden is urged to do by many, which is to direct U.S. participation in the war, shooting Russians, as I say, for the first time since 1920. A year after, two years after the First World War ended, we were still shooting at Russians against Bolsheviks in 1920. <laughs> Every Russian knows that. How many Americans know that? Any? So uh, that they have that very much in their memory. When Biden is urged to send direct planes that, that Ukrainians can't yet operate, like the F-16, tanks uh, that the, uh, they cannot yet operate. The tendency to send Americans to operate those tanks and get them right away into business will be very strong along with that. I can only hope that Biden will be pressed by a large part of the public, pressed not to involve the U.S. directly in that war and to be pursuing negotiations, which it is currently absolutely uh, eschewing, is rejecting the idea of negotiations. There's increasing information that one year ago, in early April 2022, the Zelensky and Putin essentially had an agreement within very close to an agreement on a pre-war uh, status quo, returning to a pre-war status quo in Crimea, in the Donbass, in uh, relation to NATO and everything else, but that the U.S., and the British, um, Boris Johnson, went over that and said, we are not ready for that. We want the war to continue. We will not accept a negotiation. I would say that was a crime against humanity. And I say that in all seriousness um, to the idea that we needed to see people killed on both sides in order, quote, to weaken the Russians not for the benefit of the Ukrainians, but for an overall geopolitical strategy, was wicked. And however the war started, and I think with uh, both incredibly uh, bad judgment by Putin and aggression and atrocity, and on the other hand, provocation by the United States in the sense of policies that were consciously foreseen to increase the probability of a Russian crime of this sort, tells me that I think there were a lot of Americans who wanted this war, and they got exactly what they wanted, even better than they could have imagined. Huge arms sales to our allies, the U.S. again having an essential role in Europe with an indispensable enemy, an enemy that we could not run the world without. 
Russia, and Russia stepped into that role very willingly to say that Russia had no choice uh, but to do what they did do is fairly absurd. That's like saying you can provoke a person to shoot themselves in the foot, or in this case, to kneecap themselves. Uh, Putin had no choice but to kneecap himself and to give himself 800 more miles of adversarial border with Finland and to uh, resuscitate, resuscitate NATO and get these arms sales and so forth. It's just absurd. I also wanted to bring up China, because in 2021, you revealed that the government had drawn up plans to attack China uh, with nuclear weapons over a crisis in the Taiwan Strait. Can you talk about the relevance of that? today and when you got that information? Yes. I revealed that information right after The Economist magazine had a cover with Taiwan on the cover and a big bull's mark, uh, bull mark on, on front of it, showing that it was, quote, the most dangerous place in the world at that point. And what was at stake was a U.S. intervention in the politics of China, namely supporting a secession movement, an independence movement, by a portion of China, regarded almost universally by Chinese as part of China, uh, supporting it in a way which the Chinese were totally forecasting uh, would lead to war, that they would not accept it any more than Lincoln accepted the secession of the Confederacy in this case. and. We were pressing for that in a way that I have to say I can't entirely understand. People act as if they want war with China. How can that be? Selling them arms? Yes, I see that. But why they why they want to change the relation of Taiwan, which has been pretty much the same since 1979, right now, in a way that the Chinese guarantee us will lead to war? Uh, is inscrutable to me. And you but said anyway, that these that, nuclear war plans to... over the Taiwan no. Straits uh, were made in 1958? 58. Yeah, that's right. And uh, by the way, they, there was almost a corresponding crisis earlier in 1954-55. So this was known as the second Taiwan crisis in the 50s. But uh, the idea there was that we would initiate nuclear war if the Chinese successfully bombarded by artillery islands that were within artillery range, actually within visual range of the mainland, very easy. A couple of them are just a mile and a mile and a half off from the mainland to keep those rocks from control by Beijing, uh, we were prepared to send in U.S. planes to block that group blockade, send in U.S. ships to break that blockade. And if the artillery kept that off, or there was a danger of losing U.S. ships, we would hit Chinese targets as much as, as far away as Shanghai, which would certainly, in Eisenhower's terms, and who okayed this, if necessary, if necessary to get through to those islands, we would initiate nuclear war. And he foresaw that as leading to Russian, the ally of China, uh, attacks on uh, on uh, Taiwan and on Okinawa, on Guam, even on Japan, which in turn guaranteed, in terms of our planning, all-out nuclear war, hitting every city in Russia and China, uh, killing as our estimates were at that time, 600 million people. And their relevance today? Holocaust, over Taiwan. And that was what they, that's what they were planning to do then. The number of targets in China has not reduced since then. Uh, the, uh, that was a time when any fighting with the Russians under Eisenhower, even if it started over Berlin, was guaranteed to include targeting China as a whole as well. That may have changed to some extent, but uh, to a large extent at various times, we've still continued to say, shouldn't we have a plan for war with Russia that doesn't include uh, destroying China? To which the answer is, well, do you really want to destroy Russia and not China also? We'll be destroyed in the process. That would leave China ruling the world. In short, Russia and China have to be regarded as a joint target complex. Okay, this is insanity. This is a, a form of insanity as a kind of myth and hoax that has taken over the public. It is as insane as uh, QAnon 
or as the belief that Trump is the president currently of the United States, and yet the belief that we can do less bad by striking first than if we strike second is what confronts us in Ukraine with a real possibility of a nuclear war coming out of this conflict. In other words, of most life on Earth, not all, most life on Earth being extinguished as a matter of the control of Crimea or the Donbass or Taiwan. That's insane. Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg speaking on Democracy Now! in April, soon after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He died Friday at the age of 92.